What a wonderful, joyous occasion for our church. Will you pray with me? O Lord, may the words of my heart and the meditation of every heart here be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, do you like monster movies, science fiction movies? It's a very popular genre, and perhaps one of the most well-known movies is Dr. Frankenstein. Perhaps the most well-known scene from that movie is when Dr. Frankenstein is making his monster. He has put together a variety of lifeless body parts. The monster is stretched out there on his laboratory table. A bunch of electrodes are stretched from the machine to the monster. And of course, it has to be a dark and stormy night outside. And Dr. Frankenstein throws the switch and electricity surges through the monster. As it begins to move, he triumphantly shouts, it's alive. In the science fiction, Dr. Frankenstein has taken what is dead and given it life. Of course, that's why they call it fiction. In reality, only God can take what is dead and give it new life. In our scripture passage today, the Apostle Paul reminds us that by grace, God has taken what was once dead and has given it new life. God has saved us from death and made us alive together with Christ. God has given us a resurrected life to live through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are called to live in the benefits of that new life. Today and next Sunday, I'd like to do a couple of sermons out of the book of Ephesians. The letter is addressed to the church in Ephesus, but it is more than likely what we call a circulatory letter, meaning it was a letter written to be shared and circulated throughout the churches in Asia Minor. The letter would have been shared with several churches because the message was applicable and was important for every church to hear. Ephesians is an important letter for our church to hear. So I encourage you to read the whole book of Ephesians sometime during these next two weeks. It has been called the Queen of the Epistles. John Calvin said it was his favorite epistle. Well, the people in the church in Ephesus were like many churches. People who had come to faith, but are challenged to give up their old life, their old habits, they are either unwilling or unable to change the habits they have had for a long time. They are stuck in their old ways of living and more importantly, unaware of the consequences. The members of the church were living with these bad habits that diminished their new life, the new life they had in Christ. They were doing things that hurt them rather than help them. Using the words of the Apostle Paul, they were dead through their trespasses and sins. Now death and life is a pretty harsh stark contrast, but Paul uses this stark contrast between death and life to illustrate the new resurrected life we have in Christ. You who were dead in your trespasses and sins have been made alive in Christ Jesus. The overall tone of this passage is not a negative condemnation, no, it's a hopeful celebration of the new life we have through the resurrection of Jesus. In the following chapters of the book, though, Paul points out these sinful habits they had, habits that came from a darkened futility of mind, habits that left them alien from the life of God. They had habits about bad habits on how they were treating each other, evil talk, bitterness, slander, malice. There were bad personal habits, greed, obscene and silly and vulgar words, idolatry. There were bad habits in their relationships, a lack of love between husbands and wives, disrespect between parents and children. These habits, Paul writes, come from ignorance and hardness of hearts. And though these habits may not seem that much on the outside, and they may not seem to affect us all that much, they are like a trap that hinders us and harms our life, preventing us from experiencing the resurrected life God has given us through Christ. In Los Angeles, there's an area called the La Brea Tar Pits, and they are famous for the amount of fossilized, fossilized dinosaur bones that have been discovered there. 
It's an area where tar naturally rises to the surface of the earth and it would trap anything that accidentally walked through it and eventually resulted in its death. Once an animal's feet were stuck in that tar, it was impossible to escape. And as hard as they tried to escape, the tar would simply suck them back into the pit. That's what these habits Paul is describing do to us. They rob us of life. They're almost impossible to escape. The harder we try to change our habits, the tighter their grip is on us. Well, the Christians in Ephesus were living in a pit of sinful life and did not realize it or acknowledge it. Paul said these were, they were dead in their trespasses and sins. The Greek word for sin is hamartia, and it's a word that means to miss the mark. You know, when an archer is aiming an arrow at a target, they're hoping to hit the bullseye. But unless they're an expert, they oftentimes miss that mark. Their actions are meant to be perfect, but they're slightly off. We oftentimes think of sins as only the grievous sins, when we're heading in completely the wrong direction, when we are purposely disobeying God, when we're not even aiming at the target. But Paul is describing lives being dead when we try to be good, but we fail. The word trespass means just what it sounds like, to make a choice, to follow a path that we're not supposed to be on, to choose a path that is not good for us. Throughout life, we oftentimes hear and see signs. Danger, don't do this. Danger, don't go there. But both missing the mark and trespassing are actions that we have control over. It is our responsibility, our choices, that leave us in the condition that he describes. But Paul doesn't leave us with the sole responsibility. He says, we are following the course of this world following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among all those who are disobedient. The ancient world believed that the air was thick with demons, demons that caused bad things to happen. We might call it the devil that is leading us astray. We might call it our sinful nature that tempts us to do wrong. The point Paul wants us to remember is that when we choose to follow something other than Christ, we will find ourselves trapped in that pit, that pit that harms our life. When we follow something other than God, we are dying spiritually because only God gives life. When we follow something other than God, our earthly lives might as well be dead because of its effects. Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. People are still trapped in the tar pit of sin. Like the church in Ephesus, Christians are still susceptible to living in their old habits that hurt life. The list that Paul gave the church in Ephesus is still the same list today. They say there's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new in the tar pit either. Evil talk, slander, malice, greed, idolatry, lack of love, disrespect. Sound familiar? We still struggle with these old habits. We still struggle to be free from them. One man wrote this, I've been reading so much lately about the bad effects of drinking and smoking and eating poorly that I've decided to give up on reading. The psalmist recognizes that his life was in the pit. He recognized it was in the pit before God rescued him. I waited patiently for the Lord, he writes. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He lifted me up from the desolate pit, out of the miry bog, and set my feet on rock. In the letter to the Ephesians, Paul is challenging the people of the church to look at themselves in the mirror and recognize the life they are offered in Christ. The letter from Ephesus calls us to hold a mirror up to our own lives. What habits in our lives are sticking to us? trapping us, keeping us from living a life free from the effects of trespasses and sins. Can we look in the mirror and examine ourselves as a person? Can we look at our culture and see the habits that harm us, harm us spiritually, emotionally, and even physically? With the recent violence in our culture, there's been a lot of discussion about how to prevent it. What can we do to keep it from happening again? 
I think the first step is to look at the cause of such violence. What personal and cultural habits are trapping us in a society where violence erupts and takes people's lives? Using the words of Paul, I think it's from people following the course of this world, following the spirit that is at work among those disobedient to God, following our own desires, our nature as children of wrath. Humanity seems to be stuck in this pit, unable to escape it. The psalmist recognized that it is only God who can help us. God hears our cry and rescues us from the pit that takes life. God drew me up from the desolate pit, he writes, a pit that's uninhabitable. God set my feet on a rock, made my steps secure. God put a new song in my mouth. The good news for the church in Ephesus, the new song for us all to sing, is that God has given us new life in Christ, a resurrected life through grace. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in what you lived. But God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verses 4 and 5 are the most important part of this passage. They are the turning point that changes it from being a condemnation to a message of hope. Memorize these verses. Make a copy of them and put them on your refrigerator. Put them on your bathroom mirror. Put them as a background on your cell phone. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead to our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Memorize those verses. I love how the two verses start out. But God. You know, in a paragraph, the word but negates everything that was said before it. This is a great place to visit, but. This is a nice car, but. This food in this restaurant is wonderful, but. Whatever is said before the word but is effectively null and void. Well, in our scripture passage, the word but demonstrates the power of God. The power of God to negate the effects of sin. The power of God to render sin null and void. We were dead through our trespasses and sins, but God. We were following along the course of this world and all its problems, but God. We were following the ruler of the air, the spirit that is now at work, but God. We were following the desires of flesh and senses, but God. We were by nature children of wrath, children of sin, but God. But God made a dramatic change in our lives. God gave us grace in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus, we can live not in the desolate pit, but in the new life, the new resurrected life. God has great love for us. And out of that great love, God has extended us mercy. God made us alive, and not just alive, but alive together with Christ. God negated our old life we had before and gave us a new life so that he could show us the riches of his grace in kindness through Christ Jesus. Our new life, away from the pit that leads to death, is a life where we experience the kindness of God for us. The new life is a gift from God. By grace you have been saved through faith, we are told. It is not our own doing, it is the gift of God. It is not by our works we cannot boast in rescuing ourselves. This new life is what God has made us, created in Christ Jesus. This new life is to be filled with good works, which God has prepared to be our way of life. Think of that. Our new way of life is to be filled with good works for each other. The resurrected life that Paul is reminding the church of Ephesus is a life displayed by good works for each other. Paul is echoing what Jesus wrote in the Sermon on the Mount. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. We in the church today, like the church in Ephesus and the world around us, 
are desperately in need of this new life, a new resurrected life offered by God where we are filled with God's grace and good works are a way of life. We need to remind ourselves that God has given us a new resurrected life. When we wake up each morning and we face the challenges of life, we can rely on God's grace. Our lives have challenges. We may seem like a miry pit that faces us. We may be find ourselves tempted by old habits that seek to draw us back into that pit. We need to remember that we belong to Christ. Martin Luther, the great reformer, was often tempted, was often found himself struggling with temptation. And the story is told that one day he was at his desk and he picked up his ink bottle and threw it against a wall and said, I am baptized. He was reminding himself of what Paul said in Ephesians. He was no longer dead in his sins, but God had saved him by grace. When we are tempted, let us remember we are baptized. We have a new life in Jesus Christ. And we can offer that new life to others. That's the mission of our church. When we wake up and hear the bad news about violence and tragedies and darkness in the world, we know that through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God offers the world a new life, a resurrected life. Our challenge is to display that resurrected life to the world by how we love God and how we love each other. Our greatest, most powerful tool for evangelism is to show the world the difference Jesus Christ has made in our lives. To show we have been filled with God's love. We have experienced God's forgiveness. And to show that if God has forgiven us, we can forgive each other. Through our display to the world, we demonstrate that we are what God has made us. We have a new life. So we who were dead through our trespasses and sins have been given new life. We have been made alive with Christ by God. Let us live this resurrected life, a life free from sin and trespasses that lead to death, a life lived together with Christ. Let us do good works, giving glory to God. And let us show the riches of God's grace by living forgiven lives. Amen.